When I first met Andrew, he was working for my father. That connection led us to fall in love. And eventually, we got married. After our wedding, Andrew and I decided I would stay home, allowing me to focus on my hobbies like sewing and knitting. I loved making scarves and gloves for him every winter, gradually improving my skills until he proudly compared my creations to store-bought items. His encouragement fueled my passion, and I dreamed of sharing this hobby with our future child, a thought that always brought smiles to our faces. Andrew and I have been married for six years now. Though we don't have children, we found happiness in our life together. Despite his demanding job, Andrew always made an effort to spend time with me on his days off, something that meant the world to me. However, there were moments when his long hours left me feeling isolated. Three years ago, our peaceful life was upended when I suddenly collapsed at home due to dizziness. Andrew rushed me to the hospital, and I woke to overhear him discussing my condition with the doctor. It was serious, something I would have to manage for the rest of my life. While it wasn't immediately life-threatening, the possibility of future episodes meant long hospital stays were inevitable. Despite my anxiety, Andrew was there, reassuring me. He told me not to worry and promised to visit as often as he could. During one of those hospital stays, I found myself reflecting on the many scarves and gloves I had made for him over the years, now carelessly tossed aside. Then, one day, in what seemed like a thoughtless comment, Andrew remarked, I married you because you're the boss's daughter. His words stung deeply. A cold realization washed over me. I needed to confront him about his true feelings and how we could move forward in our marriage. Though Andrew tried to comfort me with reassuring words, the wound from his earlier comment lingered. He continued to visit me, bringing my sewing tools to help pass the time. Teaching him how to sew became a sweet distraction, and we spent hours stitching together, talking about daily trivialities. It made the monotony of hospital life more bearable, and for a while, it felt like everything might still be okay. But after about a year, his visits became less frequent. What used to be daily check-ins dwindled to every few weeks. I assumed he was overwhelmed with work and poured my energy into sewing, working on a special scarf and gloves to give him during his next visit. Anticipating my discharge by the year's end, I put all my love and longing into each stitch. When he finally came back, I eagerly handed him the gloves I had made. But instead of gratitude, I was met with a cold, detached stare. Are you still making these? It's annoying, he said bluntly, pushing the scarf, still untouched, back into my hands, along with divorce papers. His words cut deeper than any physical pain. Andrew explained that he could no longer take care of me and felt it was time for us to part ways. The divorce papers were already signed, signaling the end of our journey together. Although I had sensed a change in our relationship ever since his visits became sporadic, facing the reality was utterly heart-wrenching. I had always tried to convince myself that Andrew was simply overwhelmed with work, but deep down, I knew the truth. The Andrew I once knew, kind, attentive, and supportive, would never have let work stand in the way of being there for me. When he stopped visiting without any explanation, I knew something was wrong. When I finally asked him calmly why he wanted a divorce, it wasn't out of desperation to save our relationship. I had already come to terms with the fact that I might have become a burden to him. If the compassionate Andrew I had married truly wanted to leave, I was ready to let go. Accepting this was painful but necessary, as it was clear the life we had once dreamed of together was no longer possible. As his visits became increasingly rare, I grappled with the reality that the partnership he had once promised me had become a distant memory. When I finally gathered the courage to ask him why he had changed so drastically, his answer was shockingly blunt. Isn't it obvious? Ever since I married you, it's been one problem after another. I'm so tired of those scarves and glows you make every year. Honestly, I only married you because your dad was my boss. His harsh laugh felt like a slap in the face. His words revealed a deep-seated resentment toward the simple joys I had cherished in our life together, joys that he now ridiculed as trivial and embarrassing. As he vented his frustrations I noticed the luxurious, finely made scarf wrapped around his neck, one I hadn't made. It hit me then. Perhaps he had never appreciated any of the gifts I lovingly crafted for him. Maybe they had always been nothing more than an annoyance to him. The realization stung deeply. After I became ill and my father retired, it became painfully clear that Andrew no longer felt the need to keep up the facade of a caring husband. During the first year of my illness, he had visited me regularly. But now I understood it was likely more about preserving his image at work. 
he had gained a reputation among his colleagues as the dedicated husband, caring for his sick wife. This facade had benefited him professionally, and it seemed he had only kept it up to enhance his standing. When I confronted him about this, pointing out how his visit seemed more about maintaining his image than genuine concern for me, Andrew was momentarily caught off guard. Then, with a sheepish admission, he confirmed what I had suspected. My condition had indeed made things easier for him at work. Bolstering his reputation, his candid acknowledgement shattered any remaining illusions I had. To Andrew, my worth had never been tied to our love or the life we had built, it had been tied to his career and image. I once believed we had built something meaningful, but the reality was that Andrew saw my illness as a tool to serve his own interests. This harsh truth became a turning point for me, highlighting the vast gap between the life we had promised each other and the one we were truly living. Throughout my illness, Andrew had capitalized on the sympathy and goodwill of others. He candidly admitted how mentioning my condition at work earned him extra praise for his supposed dedication and how easily he was granted breaks. If I worked late, everyone praised me for being so committed, and if I needed time off, all I had to say was my wife is sick, he explained, without a hint of remorse. His tone was almost boastful as he added that my illness had paved the way for his upcoming promotion. He dismissed his colleagues as fools, easily manipulated by his story. As I listened, I no longer saw the man I had loved but a stranger with a cruel smile, revealing his true nature. Resigned and fully aware of the extent of his deceit, I quietly accepted the reality of our situation. Well, if my illness was useful to you, at least there's that. But we probably won't see each other again. Take care, I said calmly, handing him the divorce papers. He barely glanced at them before taking them and leaving without a second thought, marking the end of our marriage. After he left, the weight of it all came crashing down, and I broke down in tears, alone in the silence. Shortly after, I was discharged from the hospital and returned to my parents' home. When my father learned how Andrew had exploited my condition for his own gain, he was furious. I never expected him to act like this, he exclaimed, shocked by Andrew's behavior. By that point, I had come to terms with the end of our marriage. I reassured my father, telling him I needed time to heal and wished to stay with them for a while. My parents were fully supportive, encouraging me to do whatever made me happy. At that moment, Happiness meant being with family and finding comfort in their love and care before deciding what my next steps would be. I decided to visit our old house, but to my surprise, the front door lock was broken. Confused, we rang the doorbell, only to be greeted by a stranger who informed us he had purchased the house a few months ago and now lived there with his family. While my parents were outraged, I chose not to cause any trouble for the new residents and left quietly. Still unsettled, I called Andrew to confront him about the house. Without any remorse, he casually confirmed, Yeah, I sold it while you were in the hospital. I kept the money as my compensation. It was my house originally. His words stung, yet I was no longer surprised by his selfishness. I had already braced myself for more of his disregard and was focused on moving forward with my life. His indifference as he mentioned selling our home left me sighing deeply. It was shocking to find out that he had sold it about a year ago, around the same time his visits became sporadic. The fact that he had made such a significant decision without even consulting me, especially since we were still technically married and hadn't finalized the division of our assets, was astounding. Although the divorce papers were signed, we had planned to meet the following week to settle these matters. But Andrew had preemptively acted on his own. When I confronted him over the phone, trying to maintain my composure, I said, you didn't understand anything. His confused response was, what do you mean? I simply replied, I'll explain next week, and hung up. Turning to my concerned parents, I managed a small smile and asked my father for a favor. I outlined my plans and requested his help in preparing everything. I've already prepared all the necessary documents. There's not much time before our meeting next week, but we'll manage, my father assured me, though his worried smile showed how much this situation weighed on him. As my father, he likely felt a mix of guilt for introducing me to Andrew and anger toward him for his actions. His determination to support me was clear, and I was deeply grateful. As the day of the meeting approached, I felt a sense of calm knowing I had my family by my side. I found myself unexpectedly smiling at the thought of Andrew's reaction to the preparations we had made. We decided to hold the meeting at my parents' house, 
My parents and I sat on one side, with Andrew facing us from across the room. Despite knowing the pain the divorce had caused, Andrew appeared utterly indifferent, even smirking at times. His demeanor was not just unapologetic but blatantly arrogant, which only strengthened my resolve. Sitting beside my parents, I felt the weight of the injustice he had done to me, but also a deep sense of empowerment, knowing my family stood with me as we prepared to face him together. As the discussion began, I maintained my calm, assuring Andrew, I don't plan to ask for too much. He tried to appear generous, claiming that the money from selling the house should suffice. My father visibly tense, anger flashing across his face, but I gently touched his hand to calm him, silently signaling that we had the upper hand and didn't need to let emotions take over. Before we proceed, there's something important we need to address, I said, taking a document from my father and holding it out for Andrew to see. The house was indeed in your name, but the land it stands on belongs to my father, who holds the title, I explained calmly. Andrew's smirk faded slightly, replaced by a frown. So what? The house was still mine. No one can argue with that. Do you think this gives you some way to get back at me? He chuckled dismissively, failing to grasp the implications. It's true. You legally sold the house, I acknowledged. However, since the land is still owned by my father, this poses a significant issue for the family who purchased it. I continued, outlining the predicament. You sold the house, yes. But as the landowner, my father could theoretically demand rent from the family currently living there. Wouldn't that cause them considerable trouble? Andrew's smirk vanished as the gravity of the situation sank in. His arrogance quickly gave way to a look of uncertainty and for the first time, he seemed to realize the consequences of his actions. I pause, allowing the weight of the situation to settle in. We don't intend to take any drastic action, but we can't just give up our rights to the land without compensation. We plan to offer the family the chance to purchase the land. We won't force them out or charge monthly rent, but it could become complicated if they refuse to buy. I continued. Originally, my father intended this land as a gift for us to build our life on, not for it to be sold off to strangers without consideration. If the family refuses to buy the land, they might even sue you, feeling missled into believing they owned everything. Imagine their frustration, thinking they had bought their dream home, only to discover unexpected expenses hanging over them. With the land ownership confirmed, we soon visited the family who had purchased the house to address the situation and seek a fair resolution. Our approach aimed not only to protect my family's interests but also to show compassion for the new homeowners, preventing further conflict or distress. When we explained the circumstances to them, they were understanding but firm. They made it clear that any legal complications stemming from the sale would fall squarely on Andrew. They even mentioned the possibility of suing him if we couldn't come to a satisfactory agreement. I watched Andrew's face pale as he grasped the enormity of what was at stake. In a shaky voice, he asked, What should I do? I responded with a slight smile. The family could buy the land from us, which would settle everything smoothly. However, you'll need to cover the cost. Once they own both the house and the land, all the current issues will be resolved. I continued, since they were unaware of the land's full value when purchasing the house, they might demand compensation from you. That's up to them. Keep in mind, the land's value is substantial, potentially worth more than the house itself. Even if you sell all your assets, it might not cover the cost. I pause, watching him absorb the situation before presenting another option. Alternatively, you could buy back the house and the land, along with covering a relocation fee for the family. This would return both the house and the land to your possession, and you could attempt to resell them. But after paying the relocation fee, any profit would likely be minimal. I let the silence grow for a moment before adding, and regarding alimony, your actions have caused me significant emotional distress. I fully intend to seek compensation for the emotional damage you've caused, I stated, my voice unwavering. You've used me as a pawn to advance your career. And now that I can see it clearly, I'm disgusted by everything you've done. Pursuing damages for this emotional distress is the least I can do. Even though the evidence may be limited and a victory uncertain, discussing it is necessary, especially given the situation you're in now. My father, the retired, chimed in with a stern, authoritative tone. I still have many connections from my career. I've been in touch with former colleagues and they've shared their opinions on your actions regarding my daughter. You're not only losing respect in the workplace, Andrew. People are looking down on you. 
he spoke with a cheerfully grim smile, and I saw the realization finally dawn on Andrew. The combination of potential legal, financial consequences, and the crumbling of his professional reputation cornered him, forcing him to confront the harsh realities he had created. The status he had built at work with me as a stepping stone was now collapsing around him. Sitting confidently across from Andrew, I clasped my hands together, smiling in a way he had never seen before, radiant, calm, and assured. Let's talk about what happens next. I began, my voice steady. Andrew, caught in the gravity of the situation, let out a strained laugh, his eyes brimming with tears. As the negotiations unfolded, it became clear that the advantage was entirely mine. He agreed to pay alimony and compensate for the land where our house once stood. We later met with the family who had purchased the house, explaining the arrangement and ensuring they were treated fairly under the new terms. In the end, the result was favorable for everyone, except Andrew. He found himself losing everything. The subtle rumors my father had sound throughout Andrew's company compounded his losses. His professional reputation eroded, halting any chance of a promotion. Isolated and overwhelmed, Andrew eventually resigned, an outcome my father shared with me later. There was a temptation to see this as karma. The gains Andrew had thought he secured through manipulation and exploitation turned out to be fleeting, crumbling under the weight of his actions. Now back at my parents' home, I found solace and purpose. I started teaching sewing classes, modestly attended by local women and children. The joy and fulfillment I derive from sharing my skills have brought me a deep sense of happiness. This unexpected turn in my life has shown me that even without the children I once dreamed of having with Andrew, I can still impart my passion and experience in ways that enrich both my life and those around me. More than anything, this journey has taught me about the resilience of the human spirit and the surprising paths that lead to true fulfillment.